And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And welcome to uh, the beginning of earnings season, actually, starting today. It's The Real Investment Show. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. It's, of course, Wednesday, hump day, getting through the week here. Um, and also to do- tomorrow is the last day of the week because Friday is Good Friday and of course that's uh, the markets are closed. So today and tomorrow uh, it's going to be a bit busy in markets because we're going to move options expiration from Friday to tomorrow. So all the options that were going to expire on Friday normally it's the third Friday of every month is now going to expire tomorrow on Thursday because again markets are closed on Friday. So expect a little bit of volatility over the next day or so. Um, but earnings season does kick off today. J.P. Morgan just uh, reported their earnings, and their, they beat estimates here, uh, $351 billion on uh, their earnings versus uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 billion, sorry, revenues. 30 billion, uh, 30.8 billion was the estimate. So again, coming in with some revenue beats, not surprising, of course, with you know interest rates and what's been going on in the markets. This has you know been kind of a good period. Now remember, this is the first quarter now that we're going through here and this was just where the markets were really kind of beginning to turn and beginning to get a bit more of this turmoil so again over the course of the next you know period of time and this is you know during this period is also where interest rates really kind of started spiking up yield curves collapsed that's going to impact their earnings next quarter so again this is kind of you know when we're looking back at you know the the trailing months That's one thing, but with, you know, for instance, mortgage applications dropping sharply here because of the rise in mortgage rates, that's all going to impact our uh, earnings for JP Morgan and these other banks. But again, uh, we're just now kicking off. So the banks always kind of start off the earnings season. And so this week we'll hear from JP Morgan and others. And then next week we'll start getting into a a much bigger bulk of the S&P 500 earnings really kind of over the next couple of weeks. So Lots of stuff we're going to be talking about, but this is also going to have an impact on the markets. You know, expectations right now, interestingly enough, for earnings is very high. In fact, Wall Street is currently raising estimates for corporations every quarter going through the next two years. However, interestingly enough, the Bank of America fund manager survey showed that expectations for profit margins are now the lowest on record. That's a big difference, right? And this is particularly interesting when you start talking about the constitution or the makeup of earnings. And if we take a look at, you know, we say, you know, what is the makeup of earnings? Well, the makeup of earnings is the profit margin, revenues of what's coming in and the profit on those revenues. And so when we start talking about the differential between profit margins and raw earnings, a big chunk of the current earnings estimates is this massive increase in profit margins that is now no longer expected to be there because higher input costs, new orders are collapsing, inventory builds are going. So this is all going to start to shrink those profit margins, which does suggest that earnings are going to be a real challenge here over the course of the next, you know, six, eight, 12 months. So there may be some decent disappointment ahead, but just something to kind of pay attention to because valuations are still very high on stocks. We're still overpaying for valuations on many fronts. It was interesting, I had a call with a prospect yesterday talking about this very thing. He's like, well, you know, I'm very conservative as an investor and I wanna make sure you're not buying companies that have no, no real revenue and aren't, you know, paying high valuations for stocks. And I was like, well, I can assure you we're not buying companies with no revenue, but we are overpaying for stocks. And he goes, well, why are you overpaying for stocks? Because everything is overpriced right now. Procter & Gamble, as an example, considered to be a value stock, right? But trading at a very high valuation. Hershey's, uh, you you just kind of name the list. Valuations for a lot of these companies that we typically, you know, talk about as being value-oriented companies. They're not a value right? Valuations are high really across the board. And this is just a result of the the massive flood of liquidity that was put into the markets over the last two years that drove prices on all assets to very high levels, very high valuations. 
and is going to be an issue that we'll have to deal with going forward. It does suggest that over the course of the next five years, six years or, or, or more, that returns on investments are going to be lower. Now, does that mean the markets are going to crash and, and all that? No, but it's going to be much harder to increase stock prices from here because valuations are so high on so many levels. And that's not even talking about price to sales ratios, which even for a lot of these value companies, there's a lot of companies we consider to be value stocks that are trading at five times price to sales. And these are companies that cannot grow sales very fast because they're such big companies. So, you know, this is going to be a challenge for investors going forward. Do again, doesn't mean the markets are going to crash, but it does mean that expectations of higher rates of returns and higher earnings growth may be a bit challenged you know, as we go forward. Um, but real quick, yesterday the markets did sell off uh, after Lael Brainerd came out and said, well, the Fed's going to just have to hike rates a whole lot faster. Of course, yesterday we got this inflation number that came in, 8.6. Everybody's very upset about this, right? President Biden is blaming inflation on Russia. That is not the cause of inflation. <laughs> Inflation is solely and always a monetary phenomenon, and it's the result of putting $5 trillion worth of liquidity into the markets and shutting down the economy. That's why you have inflation. It is not a function of Russia or anything else. And look, if you want to get you know, oil prices down, great. Open up pipelines, promote more drilling, issue more permits, let, uh, you know, uh, open up federal lands for drilling. You can do that, right? There's things you can do to bring, bring up supply to meet current demand, but that demand is already going to be into the midst of price destruction. Oil prices are already starting to come down. Now, they rallied a bit yesterday, but again, if we take a look at oil prices, oil prices have been already under pressure here for the last several months. And Fitch, uh, the uh, research service, came out yesterday saying that they expect oil prices to remain kind of range-bound for the next year between 90 and 100 dollars a barrel so okay that's fine let's talk about inflation now if oil prices remain at 90 to 100 dollars a barrel over the next year your gas price doesn't get any cheaper but inflation for gas will go to zero and that's the important thing to remember is how we measure these inflationary pressures so now the fed's going to be hiking rates you're going to have sustained high prices potentially at these levels that's going to create demand destruction, slower economic growth. That's where your real problem comes in for earnings as we go forward this year. The National Federation of Independent Business, this is a survey of small businesses around the country. And what's their biggest concern right now? Inflation. What's their outlook for sales declining sharply? Right? So this is the very basis of why you get deflation from high inflation. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, but it is also the cure for inflation is high inflation. And that leads to ultimately demand destruction, which is what we're going to see over the next few months. Now, this is going to play out a couple of different ways in the market. First, it's going to impact earnings, but it's also going to lower expectations for valuations. So valuations will come down. And how do valuations come down? Valuations come down by either earnings going up and prices not going anywhere, which doesn't seem to really be the case right now that earnings will continue to rise over the next year. So that suggests that either prices come down and earnings remain flat or earnings and prices come down with prices fall or fat, falling faster than earnings. That's how you get valuation declines and that's the potential risk we could be looking at later this year. Lots of stuff to get into this morning. It's tax day coming up. I've got Danny Ratliff joining me this morning to talk about some, some last minute tax things to do before you have to file your taxes by Monday. We'll be right back after the break. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. We're all impacted by the significance of the passage of time, especially when it comes to signing up for Medicare. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premiums? Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratley for our next virtual lunch and learn on Medicare, avoiding pitfalls and permanent penalties. Thursday, April 21st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare. Realinvestmentadvice.com. 
Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Do you know what you don't know when hiring and retaining quality employees? Compensation is more than just wages. It's personal time off. The vacation days, healthcare benefits, a 401k. Do you know what's important to them? Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable, effective package that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back this morning. Uh, it is 6.17. Danny Ratliff joining me this morning, as always. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. You? Good. You get to correct me from yesterday. Man, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this most days. I mean, we should do this every day, Brent. <laughs> what yeah, did but, Lance but it's, say it, incorrectly? It happens so rarely that, you know, it's really... Oh, I don't know. I think we really... do a show on this. I <laughs> <laughs> kid. No, it's all right. You know, it happens from time to time. You know, when you're trying to just come up with stuff off the top of your head to talk about, yep, you mess up. But I messed up yesterday. So I, I said yesterday, and look, I would I would lay money on... Now, look, I don't keep up with all the tax law changes. That's not my thing, right? I manage money. That's why I have, you know, some of the best certified financial planners in the world that work around me, Danny Ratliff being one of them. And... Um, you know, so they correct me on these things from time to time. And yesterday I said that you, and you know, tax day is coming up. You've got to file your taxes by April 18th and you need to have your IRA contributions in, but you need to have the account open by the end of the year. I will swear to you it back in the day, it used to be that way, but that's not true anymore. Maybe through one of the tax law changes or somewhere it changed. But um, anyway, you can open the Roth IRA or an IRA by Monday as long as it's done money. I wouldn't wait till the last minute, though, because it takes time to do paperwork and everybody's getting very busy right now. Yeah, I'd go ahead and get this done. So, you know, one thing that I think you're probably thinking of, Lance, historically, it's been those defined contribution plans, the employer plans for small businesses. Those do need to historically be set up prior to the end of the year or some of the defined benefit plans. So that's why we have Tom Allen, who is our retirement plan consultant. He helps people on the employer side. Make sure you navigate that properly. You get things set up. And you do all these things in, in, in such a way that it doesn't harm you or your business, and it's going to help provide a lot of additional benefits. Now, what, you're, what you just said, though, is absolutely correct. You can still set up an IRA. However, I will tell you this, and I don't know if it's from COVID or it's from people still working remotely, but the customer service end of some of these institutions, it's just taking longer. Yeah. So if you're going to go set up an IRA, I would do so now. So the big thing that most people ask this week is what can I do to save additional funds on taxes? And so, you know, what you're talking about, Lance, is absolutely right. You can go set up that traditional IRA, which will give you that tax benefit or that deduction for this year, assuming you meet these, you know, certain qualifications, meaning that one, you're not under an employer sponsored plan or you have income limitations. So these are all things that need to be considered when you're making these contributions. And, you know, plug it in, talk to your CPA. Most of the time, they're going to give you some guidance surrounding this. Or uh, I know a lot of you guys do it yourselfers out there. Go to Robo, uh, your, your, you know, what is it, uh, TurboTax. Right. And you can plug these numbers in as well. And they'll tell you historically how much you can contribute because you could be phased out or not be eligible at all if you make too much money. Right. Um, and, and a couple other little tidbits here. First of all, when you, if you do open an IRA or a Roth IRA and put money into it, you do not have to invest it into anything. 
Um, I got a, I got a, I get a bunch of questions every year, and this year is no exception. It's like, okay, I've, I've got my money in my IRA. What do I have to put it into? And it's like, you don't have to put it in anything. Just when you deposit the cash, it goes into a money market account. It's called a sweet money market, and you can just invest it at your leisure somewhere down the road. The money just has to be in the account. It doesn't have to be invested in anything. So don't feel like you know. And again, you may get a lot of pressure from wherever your custodian is. Is oh, we got to put this in the S and P or whatever, so they can get paid on it. But, you know, that there's no requirement to invest. The other thing is, is that you don't have to open up a different IRA every year. <laughs> I actually just met with a prospect recently that has like 27 different IRAs because they've yeah. been opening up a separate IRA for every single year. You don't have to do that. Um, we're putting them all together now. <laughs> so. Well, it does make life a lot easier. You don't want to <laughs> yeah. keep up with all those things. And I think that's a really good point. I know there's a lot of people discouraged or not, you know, a lot of uncertainty out there. And I hear that same thing, Lance. So I say, you know what? I don't know where I'm going to put these funds. I can't contribute this year because I don't know where I'm going to invest. You don't have to yet. Right. And I think that's a great point. And, and the other aspect is, is, you know, we talk about, you know, income and, you know, you hear us talk a lot about how to keep money in your pocket. And I think one big avenue is utilizing a Roth. And so, I've had a lot of conversations around, can you do Roth conversions right now for 2021? So unfortunately, those conversions would have to be done by December 31st. But you stand, you can still contribute to a Roth IRA. And I think one of the big benefits, I actually had a conversation with their email with the client. Uh, hey, you know, we're falling right underneath the limitations of income, so we can contribute. Do you think we should this year? Next year, we think we're going to be making much more money, um, and we won't be, be eligible. Well, heck yeah, absolutely. If you can do so... And uh, you know, you're not getting that tax deduction, but you're going to get that future tax-free growth, which I think is going to be extremely beneficial, especially in this environment. I mean, we keep talking about you know, all the numbers you talk about, Lance, mm -hmm. and the inflationary pressures and you know, the lack of a budget, once again, that we're going to see these higher taxes. So we need to find ways. You need to be very um, you know, conscious on where you put these funds in a sense of not just saying, hey, great, we're going to accumulate, but how and where do you accumulate? Is it better to take that tax right off now? Or is it better to not do it and get that tax-free growth and distribution later? And I think that's a big question for many. So we're seeing a lot of big uptick in you know, retirement accumulation and distribution plans. I think this is a really important time right now. You know, we, we thought that this would be a year that we didn't have any tax noise. And, and here we are once again, you know, visiting and, and discussing a new tax bill, um, which, you know, we, we've discussed probably DOA, especially with an election year. However, all things that need to be considered. And I think this would just hopefully kind of be an eye-opening event to notice that, hey, this is something that's likely going to go on until they get something done. Right. Um, another thing that right now just, you know, is that yesterday, of course, we had the, you know, the inflation print come out. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, you know, big concern over the inflation number. And, of course, as is always the case, when you get kind of these big shocking numbers, you get a bunch of emails from people. And, of course, the, the hot topic right now are these, in, you know, these I bonds, these inflation adjusted bonds. You know, it's, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's like, oh, buy this, you know, go buy an I bond right now. It's going to pay you 10 percent. And the question and the answer is that, yes, that's true, but it won't always pay you 10 percent. It's not you're not buying a 10 percent coupon bond that from now until maturity is going to pay you 10 percent. But there are some there, there's some, and there's also the, the problems is you can only buy twenty five thousand dollars a year. So if you've got a large account, it really doesn't help you a whole lot. But there are some tax some tax benefits to it because you can defer the interest and principal payment till maturity. So you can defer. So that way you're not paying interest income, which is taxable at your normal income hey, tax Brent. rate. Yeah, Brent, I get to correct him again. Really? Which part? Ten thousand dollars a year per person. But I, I was told twenty five thousand. Ten. <laughs> You're Man, sure today's a good day. It's a good day for you. <laughs> I've literally just read an article on this. It was twenty five thousand dollars. Literally just read an article on it. So in a calendar year, you can purchase up to ten thousand dollars in electronic bonds and up to five thousand in paper bonds. So, so, so typically a, what most people will do is a husband and wife, they'll go to Treasury Direct and, $25, and they'll go do 10000 Right. Each. Each. That's 20000 plus That's 20, five in paper, 25000 There you Nobody go. Nobody buys them in paper anymore. <laughs> Can't do it. So there you go. All right. And it'd actually be 30 You got me twice today. That's awesome. <laughs> I, sw I, I swear to you, I just had this conversation with Michael Leibowitz like last week, our resident bond expert. He told me $25,000. Well, we got to talk to Mike. That's all right. 
Oh, man. Anyway, it's all good. Um, but yeah, so but you can defer the tax. But here's the important point of this. The interest is recalculated every six months. You want to correct me on that? No, nope, you're right. OK. Uh, <laughs> I can concur. I concur. <laughs> So, but it's it's recalculated every six months, and so that rate as you start going through deflation is going to go down. So, it, just understand that we're going to wind back up at two percent or less on inflation. So, yes, you may get some payments at ten percent, but the very the for instance, yesterday uh, we bought a, a, a corporate bond yielding five percent for the next three years. Right now, that bond will pay a 5% yield for the next three years until maturity. And that's what we will wind up getting paid at maturity. And that bond will get held to maturity because of its, of its coupon. Um, that's not, that's, see, that's very different than an I bond, which will adjust for the rate of inflation. So as you go through deflation, you'll be getting less and less and less on your money as you get towards the 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 end of the maturity of the I bond. And and so your net net return on I bonds and the reason that you buy I bonds is simply to protect your purchasing power parity of your capital. Your real return, in other words, is zero. So when you buy an I bond, your real return will be zero because it is a treasury bond adjusted for the rate of inflation. And so it's only tre- it's that ten thousand dollars as as uh, Danny was just talking about it will track inflation. So in at maturity of that I bond, the, the, the value of your $10,000 will be exactly the same on a purchasing power uh, basis than it was the day that you bought the I bond. So just understand that that's what you're actually doing. It's not you're not buying a 10% coupon bond that is going to make you 10% over the next five years, 10 years or whatever it is. You're just not losing your purchasing power. Correct. But it, that's different than a bond that pays 5% to maturity where you're going to get 5% every single year until maturity. That's a very different situation. So correct. just just putting that, because, that, again, we're getting a lot of questions on that right now. And, again, for most people, $10,000 really isn't enough to really move the needle. No, it's not. But the other th- aspect of this is that we hear, you know, I'm seeing headline after headline, look at the safest investment where you can make 10%. It's like, well, hold on. And so that's a really good way to, to kind of paint that picture and a perspective to take because you're not truly getting that 10% per se on top of, but you are keeping up with inflation and not eroding purchasing power. So, you know, can be valuable, but to what extent do most people use that? Right. And, and again, this is just, you know, kind of, we get a lot of these questions that, you know, when you have these big kind of headline numbers or events in markets, there's an immediate rush to go try to do things like this. You know, so it's just, you know, important to just try to understand, you know, what the actual return of that function is going to be. And it's not always what you kind of expect from, you know, kind of the headline numbers, right? And that's that's the important thing. Um, but Monday is coming tax day. So uh, since we do have tax filing day coming up on Monday and you do, you do get a little bit of reprieve because Good Friday is, is Friday and funny how Good Friday falls on a Friday. Um, but that's also the 15th of the month. So you don't have to actually file your taxes until Monday. So when we come back, Daniel, just kind of touch on couple of things you need to be thinking about to get done. We already talked about getting your IRA funded. Uh, but when we come back from the break, we'll talk about some other things to be thinking about, you know, before you actually make that, that filing. Try to save a little bit of money. Be right back after the break. Don't go away. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. We're all impacted by the significance of the passage of time, especially when it comes to signing up for Medicare. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premiums? Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for our next virtual lunch and learn on Medicare, avoiding pitfalls and permanent penalties. Thursday, April 21st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. 
Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. The most popular Bluebell ice cream flavors ranked. I disagree with this list entirely. First of all, chocolate chip is number 20, and mint chocolate chip didn't make the list. This is a stupid list. The Real Investment Show podcast. Black Forest Cake was my father's favorite, and so every year for his birthday, I buy five gallons of Black Forest Cake ice cream. May you rest in peace. No, the ice cream didn't kill him. But he was happy. At realinvestmentadvice.com. But he was very happy. <laughs> Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare with Ratliff and Rosso. Thursday, April 21st. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premium? Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Welcome back to the show, of course. Danny Ratliff joining them this morning. Um, we're still arguing over the $25,000. <laughs> yeah, hey, I got to take every opportunity I can to catch you on something. I understand, but, but I'm still right. It's $10,000 per mm. per person and married. So that's $20,000 for a married couple plus $5,000 with your tax refund. If you that's get a federal tax th- refund. Okay. How many people most, do you know that they get a, t- number one, most, get a federal tax refund and number two er, the would the actually spend 50, it on the, buying a, a treasury direct okay, well that's two, that's two different arguments. There's nobody. The bottom, the so bottom 50% point. of Americans get tax refunds. <laughs> it's only the top 10 that and pay are living 90%. paycheck to paycheck. I understand, but. Still, it's twenty five thousand. Look, you can do these things, but nobody has ever done it. <laughs> but if you want to buy, you know, if you want to buy uh, t- I-, I bonds, it's fine. Um, the way to do it is to buy a tip fund. Uh, just, just realize that the interest is going to go away on the tip fund, and that if you get into a period where people are selling I bonds, your or inflation is going down, the tip fund is going to fall. So it's it's not. An easy thing. Also, uh, if you buy an I bond, you pay three months penalty for redeeming them within the first five years. Yay, finance! Yep, <laughs> you had to you had to search for that, didn't you? I knew where it was. <laughs> were you doing that while we were arguing? Yes, this yes. is yes. yes. This is he was over there. He was over there working on this. <laughs> Listen to these idiots. <laughs> All right, tax day is coming up. Tax day is coming up. What, so this what do is, we need to do? Well, I think the biggest thing is you need to understand your tax situation, know exactly, you know, kind of what opportunities you may have that are available to you. So if you're not working with the CPA, this is a great time to brush up on any of the, the last minute things you can do if you have not filed yet. I know a lot of people are still doing extensions. This is the first time in two years, Lance, that we have not had uh, just a, a regular filing date extension. So 
you know, we're, we're everybody's kind of got the pedal to the metal here last minute. I would I would say number one, look and see if you know if you're available if you have the availability to contribute to a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. You know, like I mentioned last segment, we're big fans of Roth IRAs. Utilize them while you can. I know lots of people can think that they're going to go away. I don't think that's going to be the case. Mm-hmm. They want your tax dollars now. They need them now. Utilize it though while you can because we will likely see higher taxes later. Another one that that goes often um, overlooked is you can cons- you can still contribute to an HSA health savings account. So the limitations are, are rather small. Now, you can only contribute if you are on a high deductible health insurance plan in 2021. And so you can contribute $3,600 if you're an individual for a family. You can do up to $7,200 for the year. If you did not max that out, I would encourage everyone to do so. This is the best account. You think I like a Roth IRA? I love an HSA because HSAs give you triple tax benefits. So you're going to be able to contribute those funds, get a tax deduction, you're going, the funds are going to grow, grow tax-free, and you'll be able to spend them in retirement on health care expenses, and those funds come out tax-free. The numbers, I mean, we've talked about them over and over again, but the numbers are huge, Lance, what, what people spend in retirement. You know, the average survey shows that a 65-year-old couple is going to spend $300,000 on just health care expenses. Mm-hmm. So the one thing, another, another way these, these accounts are misused a lot of times people confuse them with the FSA, a flexible spending account. Those spending accounts you do have to spend throughout the year. Sometimes they may give you a um, a little bit of a break or a cushion where you can spend it up until March of the following year. An HSA, you do not have to spend. Health savings account is way different than a flexible spending account. I would encourage everyone to let these funds grow. Uh, keep some in cash. A lot of times you can invest these funds. I'd keep you know the next two years in either deductibles or premiums. So something does happen, you need to meet some out-of-pocket expenses. You can do so with these funds. The remainder, I would go out and, and start to invest. So lots of opportunities here. I think this is a great account that is often so easily overlooked, Lance. And you know, thinking about the if you can get one of these benefits, it's a shame we can't contribute much more to mm-hmm. it. And there's been talks of legislation to actually increase these these amounts. But right now, what I would focus on, maxing out the IRAs, making sure you're not letting any of these things go unused. If you can do the Roth, do so. You may be over those income limitations, so you could be phased out or unable to, but you may be able to go back to that HSA and do that. Now, small business owners. Now, there's a lot of you know a lot of these things that, that you could do are probably behind you, but you can contribute to a SEP IRA. So this is one of those things that you still have a couple of days to do as well. Um, it's going to be contingent on a handful of, of things. You know, one, how many employees do you have? Uh, do you 1099 or are they W-2'd? Uh, I would talk to your CPA about this because this could be a last minute opportunity to go ahead and move some funds aside. Uh, I don't want to go too far in detail here, Lance, just because I don't want, you know, Mm -hmm. it's going to be different in a case by case scenario for each individual, but this is another great opportunity to, is to have a a nice tax deduction. That's right. You know, and, and again, there's, there's, you know, certain things you can do also to, you know, again, it's not going to minimize taxes, but when you're talking about, you know, trying to save money tax, and avoid future taxes. Mm-hmm. One thing that we don't talk probably near enough about is a whole life insurance policy that you can overfund yep. and create tax-free growth and tax-free withdrawals in the future. So it's, you know, if you use a whole life insurance, the right type of a whole permanent, life insurance. Just a permanent life a permanent insurance, life. yeah. Um, it's got it, but you need to make sure it's the right type. And if, if it meets all the right qualifications, has the right benefits, it can create... A, a real future value for you, but that's something also too. You've got to commit to you know funding every single year to make it work, and you know so it's it's part of the financial planning process. But there's again, it's just you know when you're talking about trying to to save on future taxes, there's you know whether it's you know Roth IRAs or you know uh, you know other benefits HSAs, you know there's so many things that you can get such a limited contribution to that if you're a high income earner. It helps you a little, but it doesn't help you a lot. I mean, yeah. if if you're making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, I know you got first world problems. Um, but you know, contributing five thousand dollars to an HSA or six thousand to a Roth IRA, it just it it doesn't even kind of move the needle in terms of your savings. But you can contribute a lot of money into a whole life policy that will grow tax free with tax free withdrawals. Well, I think it's 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 all about taking the baby steps, doing the little right. little things all along the way, but then also having multiple. Avenues. I mean, everybody's read The Millionaire Next Door or any of these books that you know discuss on that. Most people who are pretty wealthy have multiple sources of income, and I think this is a mm-hmm. port, a, a big part of it, and an important part of it because you want to make sure that you can diversify. You know, we everybody talks about diversifying within accounts, but really need to di- diversify the account. 
so you can pull from different areas to minimize taxes. So, you know, had a conversation with somebody yesterday, uh, one of our employees, he said, man, I hope I'm in the highest tax bracket because that means I have a really good problem. Right. right. And, and that's right. But I would hope I could have a lot of income coming in and I could find ways to to maybe alleviate some of those taxes. And so those are the, the other things that we do. So we're talking about the money management. How does that that kind of meld together with the financial planning? And how do we make sure that we can control some of these things? So, you know, Lance, we can't control the market. We, we can control our actions around it, but we can control what we contribute, where we're putting them. And then later on, that's going to give us that flexibility when we make these distributions to be a little bit more tax efficient, keep more money in your park pocket, because that's a big part of the game. Exactly. Um, anyway, if you have more questions about any of this stuff, you go by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Simply click ask a question, uh, you know, right there at the top, send Danny an, an email saying, hey, I've got a question about this or that. And he's more than happy to answer that. He's not very busy, so he can take a lot of questions. Yeah. So feel free to email him as much as possible. Man, you're and, a little bitter today. And, and My then, goodness. And if you email me, I'll give you his personal cell number. So you can call him at you know 2 a.m. in the morning. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Text message. <laughs> anyway, not really. I'll, I'll give you Brent's number. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's pretty funny when we talk about, you know, today's generation and kind of what's going on with social media companies. And, of course, you know, kind of we've talked a lot about the, you know, the impact of free speech and all this stuff that's going on. Uh, you know, Elon Musk recently took a large shareholder position in Twitter and made some comments that he is now the largest shareholder of Twitter, at least for right now. And he made some comments that Twitter is should be the town square where everybody can, you know, freely air their voices and have their opinions heard without, you know, discretion, discrimination or censorship, etc. <laughs> you got you got to love the younger group. <laughs> That's coming up. You know, if we, I, I've talked about on the show before, my wife and I've been watching a lot of, you know, war movies lately, historical, uh, factual yeah. war movies, you know, like Midway and those type of things. And, you know, the courage of these men that, you know, went to fight in World War II was amazing. And they didn't back down from anything. And, and it was, you know, you throw anything at them, they just stood right up to you and kept on going. The staff at Twitter are apparently so triggered by Elon Musk's involvement in the company that they were so stressed, they were even stressed on their monthly day off that they get <laughs> from the company. It's called the day of rest. They get a day off every month for a day of rest. It's called the weekend, folks. <laughs> so they get an additional day off? Yeah, for a day of rest. So who who actually thought this was... Oh, never mind. Yeah, exactly the point. Journalism. Uh, employees have said they are super stressed and working together to help each other get through the week after learning of Elon Musk involvement in the company. So, in other words, what are they so stressed about? Right. So here's this guy. He just he's now the largest shareholder of the company. He bought nine point two percent stake in the company. And what are they so stressed about? They're stressed about the fact that he's potentially. And this was the initial now, now, first of all, Elon Musk has already said, I'm not going to be on the board. And he's already kind of stepped back from this whole thing. And it was kind of shot across the bow. Wouldn't be surprised that, you know, with the sharp run up in the stake uh, that he took in Twitter, uh, the stock was up like 16 percent the next day. He probably already sold the position and, you know, just made a killing on the stock and went on his way down the road. Um, but they're so stressed over the fact that he may actually force them to allow free speech. Just something to think about. It's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. But this is the this these this is the group of people running your social media, by the way, in the country. Uh, be right back after the break. Wrap up the show with Danny Ratliff. Don't go away.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. We're all impacted by the significance of the passage of time, especially when it comes to signing up for Medicare. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premiums? Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for our next virtual lunch and learn on Medicare, avoiding pitfalls and permanent penalties. Thursday, April 21st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. What worries you about your money? Enhance your financial success with RIA Advisors' free financial planning tool, MyBlocks. It's our online modular manager for your money and your life. Does your vision of retirement match up to reality? MyBlocks can help to determine how much you'll need and how you can achieve. Create your own personal financial vision for the next decade with MyBlocks, our free tool at RIAAdvisors.com. Click on the Client Portal tab, RIAAdvisors.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. Danny Ratliff joining us this morning. Uh, we've talked about how the cure for high inflation is ultimately high inflation and high prices ultimately cures high prices. Demand destruction is when prices get so high that consumers are hit with an affordability crisis. In other words, you can't afford to pay for it. And when that happens, surprise, demand falls off and people trying to sell that product at a high price go, well, maybe I need to lower the price a bit. Now, it's happening right now in homes across the country. We're starting to see home prices fall fairly quickly now um, because mortgage rates are now at 5%. And, you know, this is something we touched on yesterday that you know, basically if you can't afford a 5% mortgage, that is still super cheap money for 30 years. And if you can't afford a mortgage at 5%, you can't afford the house, period, right? I mean, that's just really what this comes down to. And, you know, but psychologically, also people contract their expectations because they're used to interest rates always going down. And so they're going to go, hey, I'm just going to wait. Now, they'll be right because ultimately, as people back out of housing and back out of buying new houses, those prices will fall as, as sellers try to find buyers, and it's like, okay, I got to lower the price. If I want to get rid of this house, I'll, I'll lower the price to, to sell the house. That's just the way it works. Works in used cars as well. New earnings data from CarMax, third largest retailer of used cars, showed the number of used vehicles sold for the quarter ending February 28th declined 6.5% while prices were at record highs. Average car prices rose 40% during the quarter, or $8,300 compared to a year ago. And as such... The number of new cars being sold, uh, sorry, used cars being sold, declined. A substantial increase in used car prices of last year and the recent surge in interest rates could be the catalyst for what has recently sparked demand destruction as buyers go on strike, thus cooling red hot prices. Good news for me because, as I said, my daughter's about to turn 16 and she gets my truck, which means I have to buy a, another used car for that to replace it. So I need prices to come down. So good for me. It's interesting. I drive by CarMax in the morning coming into the office, and uh, it seems like they're completely full. But you look mm -hmm. at all the other dealerships. They're completely I mean, empty. Yeah, I mean, you look out the window here, and they're trying to every you know couple weeks or once a month, they change the way they put the cars out. They're trying to figure out how can we take up as many spaces uh, You know, with, with one it's, vehicle. It's interesting to see them you know, double park cars. Yeah, yeah, double, triple. Like, hold on, if we do it just like yeah. this. Take up two spaces. Yeah, it makes it look fuller. Every time I take my wife's car in, they try to, hey, let's flip you into a new one. Yeah, you know, 
Oh, you can it, uh, right now you can buy a new car cheaper than a used car. That's right. You just can't get all the parts to it. That's well, the other problem. <laughs> Your wheels will come later. Yeah. The GPS now doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> oh, did you need one now or in six months? Yeah. Uh, from an affordability standpoint, uh, this is from CarMax. From an affordability standpoint, you've got interest rates going up, inflation. You've got the Ukraine-Russia war. There's just a lot weighing on the consumer right now. For the lower credit spectrum customer, okay, um, which are primarily a lot of those that buy used cars, we feel affordability has maybe often priced them out of the market. That's not a maybe. That's not a possible. That is always the case. And, you know, part of the, the problem that the lower end tier is going to have is they were stretching out their used car payments to start with. You know, we saw used cars getting financed for seven and eight years. Of course, the negative equity they'll build up in that car when they try to trade it in is going to be problematic. So, you know, one of the, the benefits that, you know, people got recently if they had financed a used car for seven or eight years, I hope they sold it <laughs> because they could get themselves out of that negative equity position. But the problem is trying to buy something else. So, But the, the point here is, is that inflation has likely peaked and we will start to see lower rates of inflation for two reasons. One, so inventories are rising sharply. Uh, new orders are falling sharply. And that's really kind of across the board. And then at the, at the same time that is occurring you have this you know this kind of demand destruction that's that's going on but then also your year over year comparisons between april of last year and this year are now getting stronger so in other words the the trailing 12 months inflation is is going up and so for instance in march of next year we're going to be comparing inflation to an 8.6 or 7 whatever it was yesterday increase in inflation. So there is going to be deflation simply from the year-over-year -year comparison rate um, as we move forward over the next 12 months. So that's the one thing to really kind of be paying attention to. But, you're, but the point here is that you are starting to see the early impacts of monetary tightening on the economy, and the Fed hasn't even started yet. So just understand that when the Fed starts to hike rates and tighten monetary policy, this gets worse, not better. Now, you mentioned in the first segment about inflation, how Russia and Ukraine doesn't have that big of an impact, at least not right now. Well, what I mean by that was is that the Russia-Ukraine event occurred in February, mm -hmm. right? So we haven't seen necessarily the full impact of that? Well, no, not, not, that's not my point, is that oil prices were already on the rise long yep. before Russia-Ukraine. And, and while the White House is trying to blame the Russia-Ukraine war and genocide on higher oil prices— Russia exports to the U.S. is only about 6% of our consumption. It's yeah. not a huge impact. Yes, it is causing higher prices because of that crimp in supply, but that is not the reason we have, you know, Well, those numbers we're looking prices. at are, yeah. are prior numbers anyways. Exactly. But now what is this going to do for, to specifically like food, other things that logistically are going to be hard to get? I mean, especially with the ports being blocked, knowing well, how much, you know. That's, that's already getting, but see, all that is already starting to reverse itself. You take okay. a look at the freight index, yep. which is us shipping freight everywhere. That's declining sharply. Demand, okay. dem and the point is, is that you are getting demand destruction. High prices are causing people to buy less. Right. So you're getting that demand destruction. So all this is going to start to work itself out. And, and, and again, remember, even if oil prices are $100 a barrel a year from now, inflation is zero because it's just the year over year comparison. Correct. Right. So, you know, that's a really good point. So you mentioned these things in the inflation aspect. And, and you know, we've talked in ad nauseum about bonds and fixed yeah. income. And I know you and Mike cover this all, every Thursday as well. But that would also to potentially bode to mean that. If there, we're not going to continue to see this inflation, if it's not as permanent maybe as what everybody would, would think, mm -hmm. then we'll begin to see lower rates, at least on Treasury yields at some yeah. point. Yeah, we, we will. Yeah. And that's just, and, and again, that's what, when that will really start to show up is when the Fed begins to, you know, increase their height, you know, hike their rates, begin to reduce quantitative, uh, you know, their quantitative easing, reverse that into quantitative tightening. That creates a risk off environment for equity markets. And when you go to a risk-off environment, two things benefit from that will be gold prices and uh, treasury bonds because money will flow into treasury bonds for safety and, and, and you know, protection. And, and so that'll, that is eventually always the way that that's going to work out. So it's just a function of time we get there. So lower equity prices, you know, at least more volatility. And, and this is important. Equity prices don't have to go down. 
they can just not go up. <laughs> right. So, you know, this is, you know, we we could be into a period of just the market going nowhere for a very long time and working off a lot of the previous run up in the market. That's just never happened historically. There's never been a period in time where we just went sideways for, you know, five years. You typically get, you know, lower lower prices at some point. And when that occurs, you get this risk off environment for for equities and that is is beneficial for bonds. And again, when you have interest rates at these levels, as we talked about yesterday, this has historically been a point to where you create some type of problem economically. And it has normally been a financial crisis, you know, the, uh, you know, bankruptcy somewhere, whatever it is, it's generally a credit related event. But that's happened every time in history going back for the last 50 years so far. So this time could be different, but it just hasn't been in 50 years. Well, yeah, of course. And now what about it for all those that say sell in May? and go away right i mean that's that's the new as we're getting into you know the the new month or, or halfway through this month right well you know that that's you know the seasonal tendencies for markets tend to be weaker in the summer so if you just invested between october and april every year or may your returns actually, are historically higher right well the bulk the the bulk of the returns historically have been created between october and may Right. Okay. So if, if the if the market returns six percent a year, the bulk of that six percent a year was was generated between October and May. Summers typically have a very minimal rate of return, somewhere between zero and one percent historically on average. Doesn't mean but there's years that, that markets are positive in the summer. I mean, there certainly happens. There's also years where you're negative in the summer. Well, last year was a great year during the summer. I mean, yep. we saw that. Mm -hmm. Um you and know, then they, September, October wasn't. Yeah, correct. Now, what are right. the odds that we see since the market has had so much turmoil? What if the Fed comes back? I know, obviously, last night they're you know very hawkish verbiage, but if they mm -hmm. come back and say, "Hey, maybe we don't," you got to don't again, act as quick. And, and this is and this is the problem with trying to make these all in all out decisions. Like, for instance, we don't subscribe to sell and may go away. We subscribe to pay attention in May and really watch what happens during the summer. <laughs> um, you know, because again, markets can do very unexpected things and, and things change all the time. And we just need to be responsive to what markets do and look for opportunities to invest capital safely. But there's certainly risks this summer. Uh, you know, if the Fed is hiking rates and, and being very aggressive on tightening their balance sheet and inflation still running hot and, and interest rates are still high, you know, there's a lot of demand destruction that will occur this summer that's going to feed through into corporate earnings and corporate outlooks, and that could certainly weigh on equity prices. So there, there's certainly risk this summer um, because of the tightening that is currently happening within the economy. Yeah. So, Good point. It's always interesting because you do hear these old adages that everybody thinks that you have to live by. Right. And, you know, while some years it may make a lot of sense, other years it may not. And so I think that's why, you know, like you said, you can't be all in or all out because that's typically when you get burned. Well, look, it's, it's just like this adage that, you know, I never sell stocks because over the long term they always go up. Right. That's that's true, except for those periods in history where you lose 50 percent of your money and then you spend you know 10 years getting back, you know, five, six, seven, eight years getting back to even. That's not making money. Yes, stocks generally go up over time. The problem is you don't live 100 years, right? So this you've only got from now until you die. And if you happen to hit a bear market somewhere between now and your retirement period, you're going to be working in retirement. Walmart's hiring. <laughs> hey, Amazon's paying more to drive. Exactly. So is Walmart. <laughs> truckers, old age truckers. <laughs> This could be a new thing. Anyway, all right, wraps up the show today. Danny, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow for Thursday's edition of the show. Get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Michael Leibowitz's new article is out this morning. It's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Also check out simplevisor.com. That is our new do-it-yourself platform. It is up and running for you as well. It's all there at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. <laughs>